Hello and welcome to the Pain Options Education Channel. I'm Tim. I'm Tim too. <laughs> no, I'm Darren. Welcome to the Pelvis Series. Uh, today we're looking at performance of pain provocation tests. And once again, this is our slide that takes us through what we've been talking about in this series. So we've looked at the problem of the pelvis, uh, the subject of evaluation. Today we've looked at uh, today we're looking at pain provocation testing. Later we'll talk about management, all in it with the goal of improving clinical reasoning. So for the first part of this, we're going to step out from where we are and uh, show you performance of the pain provocation test for the pelvis. Okay, just harping back to where the area of symptoms are for people with sacroiliac joint pain. So we come in here at the iliac crest, we know that's around L4-5. And um, if Shannon was to point to her pain and point in this area here, as we said before, we'd really be thinking that's a lumbar spine because it's very unlikely for the sacroiliac joint to refer up. If we come down to the PSISs, that's around the area of the sacroiliac joints. And we'll show you this on the spine later. Um, if we, we palpate those and, and Shannon was to point to here to being a pain, well then we could think that that might be the sacroiliac joint, but remember, the lumbar spine could easily refer pain to that area as well. So that's why we need the differential diagnosis. So we're just gonna go through the five pain provocation tests. So please Shannon, if there's any pain and discomfort with any of this, let me know because I tend to forget to ask you while I'm uh, attending to talking to people. So uh, all these tests go by a variety of names. Um, this one is most commonly called the 4P test, but it could be three test or five test, but it's the posterior pain provocation test. So we flex the leg up to about 90 degrees, it's the standard. Just post this one here. So with this hand I'm going to reach under and just put some pressure on the sacrum really. I'm not trying to feel for movement, it's more just to stabilise the sacrum. So I'll just roll here, I can find the PSIS, I've just located it a minute ago, just go a little medial into that. So I'm just going to push straight down here. And just let me know if this is a problem for you. So how's this? It's fine. And this? It's fine. And this? It's fine. So I'm just going light, moderate, firm, um, just in a graduated manner. In case she's really sensitive, we don't want to go straight to firm. Um, so the other thing I would clearly then is compare to the other side. And if there is symptoms provoked, I just want to check, is that your pain? And if it's not potentially their pain exactly, is that in the area that they get the symptoms? So two things. I think thigh thrust is another yes, it is. name yep. of that test. And the hand on the sacrum, there's been discussion around that. How much difference do you think that really makes? Is that blocking force? Not a lot. And actually just last week in here, I had this patient and this test at first seemed positive, but I'm sure it was just because my hand was, um, it was palpating where they're sensitive, nothing to do with the test itself. So I don't think it's critical. And obviously there's other structures you're loading Yes. When you're doing that test. Yeah, well. absolutely. So clearly this is putting compression straight through the hip joint. And you also need to be careful of the knee and cellar tunnel joint up and that will cause pain up in the area in the pelvis, but um, you need to be aware of that. Um, the other thing I would say is, look, you can fiddle with the angle um, that you've got the femur at, but really 99% of the time, push straight down and you get what you need to know. Good. Good answer on that one. <laughs> um, next, we'll go with compression and distraction. So um, this time, Shannon, I'm just going to push on here. So it might be a little tender where my hands are pushing, so that's fine, let me know about that. But I'm more interested in if this gives you your pain around the back, okay? So um, I guess I'm just going to push here, is that okay? Yeah. How's this? It's fine. And this? Yeah. And this? It's fine. Great. So that's compression, and then um, I'll just make one note on that. So I'm not really pushing straight in, I'm pushing slightly up this way. And really, that just makes a massive difference in comfort for the person, clearly. Any thoughts on that one, Tim? No. So we'll move straight into distraction. So it's a similar thing, Shannon. This time, I'm just going to be pushing the other way. So it might even be a little more uncomfortable where my hands, in, hands are. Same thing, let me know if that's a problem for you. All right there? Yeah. Now? And this? And this? Yeah, it's good. And this. Yeah. Great. And again, this time, I'm not pushing straight out, but kind of down a little bit because that makes a massive difference on comfort for most people. So the thing around that, one's compression, one's distraction. Are we really compressing and distracting 
you say you want to get joint with those, or is it a matter of just putting different stress through the joint to try and provoke symptoms? Yeah, it's clearly easier to think about it as, as a putting stress through the joint to provoke symptoms. You can argue about different parts of the joint are getting compressed, distracted, but it's a very uh, academic debate, should we say. It's much more important that you're just putting your stress through there and seeing how they respond to that rather than if it's compression or distraction. Okay, the next one. Shannon, I'm going to get you to come right over towards me. Uh, stay laid down. Oh. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Lay back down again. Okay, so pelvic torsion. So um, I'm going to lift this leg up first. You comfortable with that? So for some people that could be enough torsion, um, but we'll keep that there. So I'm keeping firmish pressure on there and then just bringing this leg and we'll let it hang off the bed and just some slight pressure there into a twisting position. So, and bring this back up now. You're okay there? Yes, yeah, sorry. And um, again, I'd compare that to the other side. So this looks very much like the Thomas test. So if you're doing the Thomas test as part of your assessment, then you would include this as well. Any other thoughts on this one, Tim? Uh, one of the common questions is which side am I testing when I'm doing this? Yeah, briefly mentioned in the re reference to the RSA, RSA radioceramic analysis um, studies that the pelvis seems to use, move as a unit, not one side versus the other. And again, you could spend a lot of time academically, academically arguing what's happening at what joint, but I think as you said before, is this, this is putting stress through the joint, is it provoking their symptoms or not? And then other com comments again around stressing other structures. Obviously, if you don't get enough hip flexion on one leg, you might be aggravating the low back. Yep. And obviously, you do compress through the hip joint at both extremes as well. Yep, correct. Yeah. Okay, Shannon, we'll get you on your tummy. Lastly, I would just call this a PA, posterior to anterior pressure over the sacrum. Um, also called the sacral thrust test. So for me, you can find the PSISs and go straight between these. This is the grip that I prefer to use uh, because you can localize the pressure reasonably well but still be comfortable for the person. And Shannon, is this a problem? No. And how do you feel with this? That's fine. And with this? Yeah. So again, just light, moderate, firm from one to the next to the next without stopping. And really just 99% of the time, push straight down and you'll get the information you need. Sometimes you might go a little more distally, perhaps slightly more proximally, maybe a little over to the sides, but 99% of the time, straight down, you'll get what you need to know. What about people that are quite lordotic? Would you use a, a pillow under their hips or anything? Yes, certainly can. And you need to modify these for people who might be pregnant as well. So maybe just go on your side facing away from me, Shannon. So certainly, um, yeah, as you say, someone that's lordotic, uh, not comfortable with just being flat or, or during pregnancy. So I could easily apply that same um, test. So I'm just stabilizing lightly here and again doing the PA right on the sacrum. And the compression the other way you see it done is in this position and pushing straight down. So do need to modify these in, in relation to the patient's comfort in the test position. Okay, very good. Well done, Darren. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, there's a few vagaries around these tests that are worth probably just discussing now. Um, I've got pictures of them all here. Um, it's funny that um, I lost one that's coloured and I could only find the black and white one and that's the compression one. So I haven't made that black and white on purpose, I've just lost the coloured slide, but as it turns out, that is the one that there is the, um, some conjecture about. So clearly uh, some people with sacral joint point pain like compression. Yeah. Um, so really to have that as a pain provocation test, it's unclear how that works if some people like it and others don't like it. Yeah, well I won't try and analyse the answers to that, but it does come back to that concept that you need at least three out of five tests to be positive to yep. diagnose sacroiliac joint as the source of symptoms. What's your experience on 
if someone has got SIJ pain, how many of the tests are normally positive in your experience? Yeah, two, uh, two things around that. With um, compress, uh, well, three, uh, four or five usually, and look back at my PhD data on that, that's what it was, and it seems to be the majority. It's rarely is it one or two and you're going, oh, is it or isn't it? It's yeah. usually reasonably clear. Is that your finding on that? That's my experience, and I think that's important. And the other part is when the tests are positive, they're usually clearly positive yeah yeah so for example the Ganslands or the torsion test it's quite common in that that something will be sensitive because you're stressing a number of structures hip joint like we mentioned and lumbar spine yeah. to the extremes of that so someone with back pain or hip pain you'll probably provoke their symptoms with that but like you said asking them about the location of symptoms mm. but then also that needs to add up with the other tests so Generally, if someone's clearly positive, there's four or five of them are positive. If it's a bit vague from there, in my experience, the odds of it being sacroiliac joints are much lower, and that's where you need your other screening tests as well. Yeah, agreed. And uh, just on compression, like from a research perspective, we've taken compression out of that. And when we, when we look at inclusion criteria and substituted um, palpation in there, so... There's some evidence around palpation as an individual test. and So palpation over the sacroiliac joint, yeah, you mean? Yeah, the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament. Forgot to have the spine here, but it's uh, really from the PSIS going down and a little little medially. Yeah. And, and down from the PSIS and a little lateral that you might be able to get to the inferior aspect of the sacroiliac joint. Okay, so yeah. if you're palpating around that region and slightly inferior. Yeah. That's the other one. Yeah, you could, from your you could substitute that in there. Yeah. The other thing around the compression distraction, again, I don't really like either as far as calling in those terms because it's not clear exactly what happens. But one thing clinically that's helpful, you demonstrated that with someone lying on their side. If they are someone that's very sensitive and also particularly in pregnancy because of the position being mm. more comfortable, I find if you do the sacral thrust test or the sacral PA provocation test and that compression slash distraction test and side lying, if they are positive, that's really helpful because for those two tests, you're not really moving very much else, are you? No. So you're not really stressing the lumbar spine a lot or you're not moving yep. the hip joint a lot, whereas with the other tests, you are. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Probably the other thing that just came to mind around that was what makes sense for the patient and um, having um, you put your hands on and really stressing out those structures around there, they can be reasonably confident that you've had a good look at their pelvis and therefore whatever um, interpretation you take out of that and share with the patient, they can rationalise that in terms of is that pelvic structure part of their problem or not. Yeah, agreed. And then if they're less positive, then perhaps your lumbar palpation or movements of the lumbar spine clearly reproducing their pain helps you go, actually, this is more yeah. where it looks like your pain is coming from. Yes, and reflective questioning to the patient around that can be very powerful in terms of getting them on side around what's going on. So what might you say? Give me an example of that. Um, well, I might say, well, you know, during the testing of the uh, lumbar spine, we've if we haven't provoked their symptoms during the sacral joint pain provocation test, we have provoked their symptoms. So I'm asking them, you know, is that your symptoms? They might say yes. And I'll, I'll just ask them, well, what do you think that means that that's positive where the other tests we did on your lumbar spine were negative? Yeah, and get them to reflect on that in that way. Yeah. And I mean, that can be massively important in terms of, you know, the uh, scans on the lumbar spine that find something just by chance and um, yeah. people might be... Um, have a firm belief around the, that how that's contributing to their disorder. So yeah. that kind of self-reflection on the patient's behalf is useful. Sure. And what about the other way where the person thinks their sacroiliac joint's unstable, for example? Yeah. Yes. And you're able to screen those tests and say, look, these are tests that provoke the sacroiliac joint. Are they reproducing your pain? Possibly not. Yes. But now I'm pushing on your lumbar spine, for example, or yep. your hip joint or muscles in the area, and that's clearly reproducing your pain. Yeah, so it works nicely both ways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, anything else about the pain provocation testing? I think maybe one other point is 
you need to practice them, you need to know how to do them quickly and efficiently, but you must be effective. So then with confidence, you can say to the patient, we're screening this and have a good routine around that because if you're only using them occasionally, then your confidence is going to be lower and it makes that whole clarity around your assessment process less mm -hmm. otherwise. Yeah, and just to reinforce what you said, you certainly taught me that you can do those in one or two minutes and done. Yeah. So it's not a big time consideration. It's no. get in there, get it done, do it properly, and you've got that information. And certainly with physiotherapists that we've trained, that's what we've taught. We've actually put them on the clock and said, right, you need to screen the hip joint, the lumbar spine, the sacroiliac joint. You've got three or four or five minutes total go so do that as an efficient routine as part of your system and it really does help the examination process yeah great all right so i think that's good for pain provocation testing but do you have any other questions tim or no i don't darren do you no i don't think i have any other questions at this time but if i did i would email them to education at painoptimist.com and i would hope that you would answer it i try my best very good thank you oh not yet just a reminder that you will catch us on our next episode where we'll be talking about, um, well, it would be interesting because we're kind of saying that um, sacral joint pain here is not a movement disorder, more of a pain disorder. So we're going to talk about some evidence around uh, pelvic girdle pain as a sensitivity disorder rather than a movement disorder. Sounds interesting. I think it is. Good. All right. Bye for now. See ya. Thank you.